Church that makes here at Malden. We're glad you're here with us tonight. Got just a few announcements before we begin our worship service. I hope each one of you picked up a bulletin to go over things that's in the bulletin. Let's remember all of our shut ins that's in the bulletin are sick. Also, let's remember Deborah, Rick, and Ruth. I know Deborah said she'd be a couple weeks from when we have some more tests done, so let's remember her. Also, uh, Judy Brown was not with us this morning, she was sick. And Loretta Kiefer, she had a heart cath done this past week, and they said that now she uh, will be able to have her procedure done that she's going to have done, but they don't know exactly when it will be. Also, Kay Maddox had her heart cath, and everything showed good, but they're still trying to figure out why her blood pressure going up and down so much. Also, Barney asked us to remember Rachel. Uh, her, I understand they're changing her medication around because she's got a lot of side effects from whatever she was taking, so they're trying to get that straightened out to help her out. <clears throat> also, the personal work group meeting will be after evening service, so anyone can stay and help with that will be greatly appreciated. And also, the men's business meeting will be after this evening services. Uh, into our worship service tonight. Our song leader will be Joel Foster, our lesson by Dennis Strine, our closing prayer by Joel Maddox, and we'll begin our worship service with opening prayer to Joel Foster. Bow with me, please. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this, another opportunity to come together sing songs of praise and study a lesson of your word to open up to you with our prayers and petitions take the Lord's Supper give our means we're so thankful for this congregation the church the world over we pray that you be with us that we can follow after your word that we can stand for your word that we can be merciful, but that we can stand so that you will be glorified and we will do those things as you would have us to do. Father, we pray for all of those that are in need of our prayers, those that Brother Dale has mentioned, others that we may not know of, be with the doctors, families that help take care of them. We pray that the things that are done for them will bring a restoration of health. We know that you have the power to do so, Father, if it is your will. We ask you to do, to and do so, and in the meantime, we ask that you comfort them. Father, we pray for our country, for our leaders, for our military, for our first responders, our judges, 
pray that you would defeat them in those things that are contrary to your word, that you would help them to uphold your law, that you your your be uh, emissaries of you, that you would defeat them in those things that would keep those from worshiping you. And we pray that we would, stay, if that was time to come, that we would stand and continue to follow you and follow your word. Father, we pray for the church the world over. We pray that your word will be spread, that your gospel will be presented throughout the world, that we can be shining examples of what you would have us to be, that we can reflect the glory of Christ, Father. We pray that we would always do those things that are, that are in harmony with your word. And when we do fail, Father, we do fall short often. And when we do fail, Father, we pray that you would forgive us for those things. Satan is strong, Father. He throws many stumbling blocks before us. Be with Brother Dennis tonight as he brings us our message. Be with each of us that we, <clears throat> that we listen attentively, take those things and apply them to our lives. We pray now that you be with us in this worship service, that we can raise our voices to you, that you will be glorified and accept our worship. In all things, Father, your will be done for we ask the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. One. One. Each day I'll do a golden deed by helping those who are in need. My life on earth is but a span, and so I'll do the best I can. Zero. 
zero two. Four zero two.
encouragement. Six, three, four. Six, three, four. And before Dennis comes and speaks to us, two, one, nine. Two, one, nine. All day long of Jesus I am singing is my song of joy will ever be. All the while he keeps my heart bells ringing for his love is everything to me. He's my king, oh no, I dearly love him. He's my king, no other is above him. All day long in raptured praise I sing. He's my savior, he's my king. Strings of love around my soul are flowing. From his heart, love's everlasting spring. That is why my faith in him I'm showing. That is why an endless song I sing. He's my king, and though I dearly love him, he praise I sing. He's my Savior, he's my King. In his life, I'm going home to glory with the souls who trust his saving grace. Going home to sing and tell his story in the Bibles to Matthew chapter 9. Starting in verse 9 and reading through verse 13, it says, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in a tax collector's booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, he said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came to call I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. If in those days you were to walk around Palestine, you would encounter many types of people. Some of those we're very familiar with. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the priests, you know, the religious people. And Jesus did have dinner with a few of these people. While Jesus might not have been liked, he was very popular, and so that would make for a really good dinner guest. And then you have the majority of the Jews, those hardworking Jewish middle class, so to speak. This is a group of people that often surrounded Jesus. They were 
were common people. They were the hard workers, the ones who put their boats out early in the morning and fished all day. The ones who spent all day in the fields, the craftsmen, the housewives. A majority of the people, if you will, that you would find in Galilee and Judea. And many of these people followed Jesus. Many of those same people claimed to be disciples. All up until the point where Jesus' teachings got extremely difficult to bear. And then you had the outcasts. The Hebrew word for outcast originally meant the materially poor. But as time went by, it started to include those who were downtrodden, the outcasts, the voiceless people, those who had absolutely no influence. It is this group of people that were oftentimes marginalized in society then. These were the people who felt unwanted, who felt uncared for, alone. Matthew, of course, we know that he was a tax collector. Chances are Matthew was financially well off. But he was limited on friends. While you may not think of him as being downtrodden because he probably had money to spare. He was part of that group that people oftentimes would cross the street to get away from. Familiar with the account of, Mac of Zacchaeus? In Luke chapter 19. He was a small man. But he really wanted to see Jesus. But because of the crowds, he could not see over them. Kind of like being short and in Tiger Stadium. And you're on the next to the last row. And you got to stand on the seat to see over everybody else. So you can at least see part of the gate. He had to do something very undignified, and that was run down the street ahead of the crowds and climb up in a tree, just so he could get a glimpse of Jesus. It's sad when society groups two separate groups of people into one lump sum, tax collectors and sinners. We find this used several times in the New Testament. And on one occasion, Jesus even told the religious leaders of the time that the tax collectors and sinners will enter the kingdom of heaven before they do. This evening, the point is not about Matthew. It's not about tax collectors. The lesson tonight is about how Jesus treated people who were on the very outer rim of society. Oftentimes we read in the Bible of Jesus sitting down and eating with them. Talks about his conversations that he would have with sinful women. The Samaritan woman at the well, the one that was caught in adultery. Jesus would go and heal the lepers when no one else would go near them. Jesus would heal the blind when others ignored them. And he would become friends to those who had no friends. I'm going to read a verse. It's out of Isaiah. And I want to see if you might recognize that verse. I'll tell you the verse after I read the two verses. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, 
and the opening of the prisons to them that are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, and to comfort all who mourn. That is Isaiah 61, the first two verses. It is a portion of the scripture that Jesus reads in his hometown of Nazareth in Luke chapter 4. It was there that Jesus said that what Isaiah has said has come true in him. See, Jesus came not only to save the world, but to reclaim the poor in spirit, to reclaim the downtrodden and the outcasts. When Jesus went and was eating with Matthew and at his home, the Pharisees, those religious leaders, they questioned the other disciples about what Jesus was doing. And I hope that when I read those verses, you caught what they were trying to do. You see, they didn't come to Jesus. They came to divide. They wanted the disciples to look at Jesus and to look down on him because of what he was doing with those sinful people. Jesus, when he heard those comments, I guess in a, in a way he got in the face, though I can't picture Jesus getting upset or saying anything nasty, but you can probably feel a little bit of the sarcasm when Jesus said those who have no need of a physician, <laughs> that only those who are sick have that need. The Pharisees thought they were, well, that they were spiritually healthy. But Jesus saw them in a much different light. Then he goes further and says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Now let's move forward to today. And ask the question, who today do we consider to be the marginalized? Now if we were just to think of this and start thinking of things off the top of our head, we might start off with the poor, the homeless, those who may be chronically sick, we might go on to groups like children or senior citizens, maybe those who are single for some reason or another. The people that don't seem to have much of a voice in society today. You know, it's possible they might have a job that somebody looks down on. Maybe they pick up the garbage cans and throw them in the truck. The only reason I look down on them is because they come up Log Shoals Road during the time I come to work and I have to follow them. It's not the profession, it's the time of day they do it. Maybe the standards that these people live by don't measure up to ours. But for whatever reason it is, we often in society consider them less than. The place that Jesus started with those on the outer circles of society was with personal interactions. Whether it was with Matthew, whether it was the Samaritan woman at the well, or whether it was the children that were brought to Jesus, Jesus interacted with them in every case. Everybody wants a true relationship with somebody. They want an emotional 
investment. And sadly, that emotional investment is not something easy for us to do. Some people are more draining than others. Don't look at John. <laughs> Have you ever had a conversation with somebody and you walk away from that conversation conversation saying that's 15 minutes of my life I'll never get back but what are we to do with those kind of people Jesus told the Pharisees to go and learn what it means to desire mercy not sacrifice personal interaction with people that don't fit in is a sacrifice but when you open your heart to those people that is mercy the second thing that Jesus did was to meet their needs James chapter 1 it's those verses sometimes that always seems to stick in our mind, verses 26 and 27, where we may not be able to quote it verbatim, but we can quote it to some extent. But James says, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Your religion that is undefiled before God the Father is this to visit the orphans and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unstained from the world in our Christian walk what is the one thing that turns people away from religion it is the tongue from the Christians. If it is not bridled, it shows their true heart. If our mouth gets in our way and shows our true actions, our religion, our beliefs are worthless. When James talks about the orphans and the widows, he's talking about people who are vulnerable. Not necessarily those two classifications of people, but all who are vulnerable. These are the people who are more often mistreated and neglected than any other. And sadly, that can happen within the church, even if there is no evil intent. And I'll explain it this way. If we are too busy to connect with their lives. You know, it's easy for us to forget about people who are not overly active in a congregation. From our youngest to our oldest, they are the groups that oftentimes are neglected. But we need to keep Galatians 6 and verse 10 in our minds constantly and at the point where we don't forget it, that it comes to light every time we think about it. To do good to all men, to everyone, especially those of the household of faith. We need to make the most of every opportunity we have. Or Jesus valued their gifts. People that we don't think too highly of are on that outer rim of that social circle oftentimes have gifts that we do not realize that are there. In Paul's teaching to the church at Corinth, 
He taught that the church is a body. And that one part of the body cannot say that it doesn't need another part. Read with me 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 22. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body, we think less honorable, we bestow great honor, honorable. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. For many, many, many years, the human body, it was the thought that the appendix was a worthless piece of appendage that was in the body, that it had absolutely no function until, say, within the last 20, 30 years, they finally realized that it was an important piece of the body. I submit if God put something in the body, it had a function somewhere along the line. But you see, as part of the body, as part of Christ, we are all equally important, regardless of of where we stand, regardless of what we do. Eisenhower, General Eisenhower, had reprimanded another general in the army for speaking of a soldier as just a private. He told that other general that it was the private that wins the war. And that's exactly what Paul is saying in these verses. The war is won when we all work together as one body, and no part is less than the other part. Every congregation, doesn't matter how strong they are, doesn't matter how large they are, how small they are, have folks who are marginalized. Some, because they choose to live that way. Some, because they spend most of their time complaining. Maybe draining emotional resources from others. But there are many that are marginalized simply because they don't know how to fit in. They don't know how to find their place. They don't know how to share the gifts that they have. They may not be sure what value they can bring to the body. It's that group that we can help. Show them their value. Help them to become that integral part of the body. Instead of them deciding to be separate. Friends, we need to pray for them and to love them. We need to show mercy. As members of this congregation, for those who interact personally with people that are oftentimes left alone, meet their needs especially if we have the ability to do so Let's value their gifts Let's help them help themselves in service to this body and when we can do these things we will have less marginalized members and more unity <coughs> in the body of Christ if there is anyone here this evening whose desire 
is to become a child of God. We want to give you that opportunity this evening. Through repentance and confession, through that New Testament baptism, to have your sins washed away. Not for the cleansing of the body, but for a good conscience. We want to give you that opportunity this evening. And if you are a child of God and you need to make things right with God or you just need our prayers, we want to give you that opportunity also as together we stand and we sing. The great physician now is near the sympathizing Jesus. He speaks the drooping heart to cheer. Oh, hear the voice of Jesus. Sweetest note of Sarah's song. Sweetest name of mortal tongue. Sweetest carol ever sung. Jesus, blessed Jesus. His name is spelled by guilt and fear. No other name but Jesus. Oh, how my soul delights to hear the charming name of Jesus. Sweetest note in Sarah's song. Sweetest name of mortal tongue. Sweetest carol ever sung, Jesus, blessed Jesus. And when to that bright world above we rise to see our Jesus, we'll sing around the throne of love, his name, the name of Jesus. Sweetest note in Sarah's song, Sweetest name on mortal tongue, Sweetest carol ever sung, Jesus, blessed Jesus. Please be seated. The table is prepared for those who did not have the opportunity to take the Lord's Supper this morning. If you come forward this time, you'll be served. All of our tenets of worship are extremely important. For without one, we are delinquent in our honoring of God and his command. <coughs> but of all of our tenets of worship, coming around this table and sharing this memorial feast with our Lord and Savior, made possible our being here today. Without it, without this feast, without the sacrifice that Jesus made, this would just be another day of the week. The bread that represents the body of our Savior, the one that he allowed and chose to be nailed to that cross. It's the greatest event in human history. And the one that has an eternal implication. Will you bow with me, please, as we give thanks for the bread. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the emblems that are before us. This bread, we ask your blessings on it. And we pray, Lord, that as we take of it, that we uh, focus all of our attention on that sacrifice and just what your son has done for this whole world. And we're grateful, Lord, that you have given us that, that hope of eternal life, and that it is our faith and our strength in that faith to believe that when that day comes that we can be with our Savior face to face and with you. We thank you so much for that. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Continue in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, for this fruit of the vine that represents the shed blood of your Son. It was through that shed blood, Lord, that we are blessed with the gift of eternal life, we're blessed with the gift that this blood that sheds continually cleanses us from our sins. 
And we ask your blessings on it, Lord, and we'll be, take it in a manner that is acceptable to you. And that it continues to help keep and focus our minds on what is important. We ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Leave a basket on the table for those who may not have had the opportunity to give today. Bow with me, please. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all the things you have entrusted into our care. And we thank you for blessing us with those things. So now, Lord, as you entrusted those into our care, we ask that you please accept our gifts in return. And that the gifts that we give, we give with a, joy, a joyful heart and a cheerful heart, and that these gifts, Lord, will be used to further your kingdom here on this earth. And we pray, Lord, for that day, that great day, when there will no longer be necessary to take care and to share your word, that it will all have been fulfilled, and we will rest with you in eternity. And we ask these things in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Personal works group is going to be in the last classroom by the door outside on the left, across from the office, okay, because we'll have our men's meeting in the other, and, and it's not that we don't want you overhearing what we're saying, but we don't want to interrupt either either one of ourselves, so, uh, so if you just be mindful of that. Uh, is there anything further by anybody that we need to make mention of before we close? At this time, if you'll stand, we'll be dismissed with prayer. Gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we are thankful for all the many blessings that you have given us throughout our life. We're thankful for Joe and his ability to lead us in songs of praises unto thee. We're thankful for Dennis, for his ability to bring thy word to us. We pray that each and everything that we have done here is in accordance to thy will. We pray that as we go to our homes and go out through life this week, that we will be examples for others, that we can teach them thy word. We pray that you will be with the ones that are sick, the ones that are struggling, that you will be with the doctors and nurses that attend to them. We pray that you would always watch over us, that you would guide, guard, and direct us throughout our lives and pass on your soul. Amen. 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 Uh -oh. Hi, Vicky. You don't want that calm.